Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tom, let me start with what Rory Stewart was saying there. It is clear that Islamic State is losing territory in Iraq now and could well come under pressure in Syria too, particularly it may only be a matter of time before Raqqa falls. It's down. It used to control a whole swathe of the coast of Libya. It's now down to a small area of Sirte uh, in, in Libya. But curiously, in a way, it could make them more dangerous here, if they're being driven out of the Maghreb and the Levant, they could be more dangerous here. Discuss. Absolutely. That was a very interesting admission there by a, a government minister, of all people, because... A well-informed government minister. A very well-informed government minister who knows about these things. Chasing ISIS around the Middle East is a bit like chasing Al-Qaeda around um, uh, South Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. It's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. You smash them somewhere else, they pop up in Somalia or the Maghreb or wherever it may be. And Rory Suarez, although it may not particularly please Downing Street or Number 10 to hear that, he's absolutely right to warn that these guys are going to go somewhere. And it may well be inserted, for example, mm. across the boats of the Mediterranean to Italy and Southern Europe. There were reports in the uh, American press uh, that I was reading in the early hours of this morning, as you do, uh, that a lot of the foreign fighters who were in Mosul, they have gone already. And which raises the question, to where? To where? Uh, whack a mole is a very, good, a very good description. I think it's quite right for co government ministers to warn that it may have repercussions here. We've been involved in this with full public consent, as far as one can tell. Mm. Uh, and after all, if it doesn't happen, if there aren't horrors and outrages here and in the rest of Europe, mm. that's fine. If it does happen, at least a government sounds prepared. Mm. Were you uh, surprised by how categorical uh, Nia Griffiths was, the Labour's fourth defence spokesman of this year so far. Um, I say so far, we have no reason to think there'll be another one this year. She was categorical about uh, support for the Allied action in Iraq and categorical about Russia, so much so that, he, that, that perhaps Britain should take tougher sanctions on its own, even if it can't get the Europeans to fall in line. I, I was, found that interesting. I was quite surprised by that. I mean, I think... Uh... Uh, Tom may be right in that Rory said more than perhaps he was intending to, but I thought that some of what she said sounded politically imprudent in the context of the current Corbyn-led Labour Party. Um, I'm not sure that she had cleared those lines with the leader's office. It, it sounds okay. like she and Jeremy are in a different place on those issues. Like you category error about <laughs> Ill, led. Ill I'm, not sure there is, I'm not sure there is exactly that much leadership. I think people well. at the moment get out there and say what they think is right for the yeah. party. And, and she, like, sound, she sounded dead I right like to candor. me. Yep. Whether it's ill-advised or not, when people answer my question, when they answer them, it's great. I want to move, to, to move on, because Brexit, of course, never goes away. Uh, this week, um, we've seen Hilary Benn, former Shadow Foreign Secretary. He's now going to be the chair of the Select Committee in the Commons, which will monitor the department for Brexit and have all sorts of people coming to it to give uh, testimony and so on. Let's just hear what he told Andrew Marr this morning. I think it is going to be very important for the government to indicate that if it is not possible within the two years provided for by Article 50 to negotiate both our withdrawal agreement and a new trading relationship, market access, including for services, 80% of our economy, a million jobs in financial services, that it should tell the House of Commons that it will seek a transitional arrangement with the European Union. If a deal's not been done at the end of the two-year Article 50 process, would the government go for a, an interim agreement or would it fall back on dub, what's called WTO, World Trade Organization rules? Well, my understanding is that the Article 50 negotiation uh, doesn't actually specifically include what Britain's future trading relationship with the EU is going to be. Um, and so it's perfectly possible that Article 50 could be triggered after the two years. We haven't concluded a trade deal, mm. uh, but the trade deal negotiations are ongoing, but we're outside the EU. But but our trading relationship is the most important question. I mean, if the art Article 50 doesn't cover that, you wonder what it's going to be about. Absolutely essential, vital. And the idea that it's going to be done in two years, I mean, Canada's taken nine years and now it looks as if it's failing. Yeah. All because of 
the Walloons. One small Keep your bit. eye on Wallonia. Absolutely. <laughs> one small bit of one country yeah. can blow this apart. But so that is bad news for the EU, as it may be for any prospective deal. If you cannot do a free trade deal with Canada, progressive, social democratic, democratic Canada, who can the EU do a trade deal with? Well, you'd think it'd be easier to do a trade deal with us because, after all, we already have the level playing field reg yeah. regulations all there in place. You'd hope it might be easier, but it may well not be because, in the end, it's going to hinge on single market. Are we going to be, are we going to be in or out? If we're in, can we possibly have even a small break on immigration? It looks like not. What's really interesting about the polls, the last two, I mean... The opinion polls, not the polls. Uh, <laughs> the polls are also interesting. <laughs> interesting, too. In the last two opinion polls have shown a significant change in public opinion where people are now saying they think that uh, actually trade, the economy, single market is more important than immigration. Now, if it's really true, as the Observer's reporting today, that banks may be on the move and in a year's time there may have been a significant uh, you know, collapse in our finance uh, Inc the income we get from finance, the income the Treasury gets, then people, public opinion may change and they may say, you know what, we don't want much, we don't want more immigration, but this isn't a price worth paying. Everything tends to get seen through the Brexit lens at the moment, even this, uh, the failure so far, I'm, I, I'm answering it may, it may try to put it back on the rails of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. But things are not always as they seem. The Canadian EU free trade agreement was about increasing free trade uh, between the EU and Canada, therefore subject to the ratification of all members. Any deal we do uh, will not give us the same access that we have at the moment. It will be, it, the question is how much will it be diminished? So it may not be subject to the same ratification process. Uh, no, absolutely right. And another unbelievably technical point as well to follow on mm. from Toby's uh, uh, that we still don't know is if we can get this free trade deal with the EU at the same time as our, our Brexit uh, uh, talks and deal, the divorce deal as well as the remarriage deal as people keep expressing it, then one we know gets signed off by QMV, the Brexit mm. deal we don't need full majorities but the trade deal may still need all 28 or all 27 including Polly's great friends the Wallonians. <laughs> so, uh, these are huge areas. Uh, and part the, of the but, but that's all part of the majority of So these are all part of the unknown unknowns, which is right. exactly why but Theresa May would love a transitional deal to, to push this one deep, deep and long. I was quite surprised to hear Hilary Benn pushing this line uh, this morning because um, they've been all over the place, the Remainers. First, they wanted a vote uh, after Article 50 had been triggered about the nature of the deal. Then they wanted a vote before Article 50. Now they're talking about a vote before uh, uh, Article 50 is triggered about whether to support membership or not of the single market. Now he's introduced a fourth thing, which is, well, maybe we shouldn't uh, leave the EU. There should be some sort of temporary transitional arrangement. They need to make up their minds about what it is they're pushing for and what their best hope of obstructing Brexit is and stick to that. Let me stick with the dimension of it. Again, we tend to see it through the Brexit lens, which isn't always helpful. Calais. Uh, the French bulldozers, if I can put it brutally, move in tomorrow. We are going to see, I would suggest, some pretty disturbing scenes on the television. I think we'll tomorrow. see horrible scenes, and I think that our government has handled this very badly. <laughs> Having passed in the Dubs Amendment in, in April saying that we would take something like 3,000 children, a lot of those children have actually disappeared. Save the Children, other responsible charities there are very worried that people traffickers have mm. been in there, and a lot of those children have vanished. And I think we have, you know, we haven't sent social workers in. Mm. No, no preparations have been made, whatever. At the last moment, we're suddenly grabbing anyone who could find some of them, maybe children, some not. Well, well you, you raise an interesting point because we, we don't really know how many we are meant to be taking or how many we should be taking. A huge argument has arisen over what the age of some of the ones coming in is. I mean, could, is this another Horlicks from the Home Office? 100%. And it makes you think, uh, didn't Theresa May do incredibly well to, to survive six years of this? <laughs> Amber Rudd, this is her third rocky road by counting three months. So it's quite clear the Home Office just didn't prepare for this. They didn't prepare for any age verification. Uh, they didn't prepare where these people could go. We learned this morning that they refused an offer from the local government association to, to come down and help with age verification. So it, it needs to be unpicked and in a big hurry. And also, we, we don't know how many we'll, we'll take because, yet again, the Home Office won't even say.
I want to talk about airport capacity, but I'm not, because I think we've got nothing to say about it till we get the statement on Tuesday from Transport Minister Grayling. So let me just ask you this. When you look at the state of the polls, you see the decision on airport uh, runway expansion being kind of kicked down into the long grass a little bit for a year. Are we heading for an early election next year or not? I think Theresa May will do everything she can not to have an early election. And I think the main reason for that is that if there is an election before 2020, it's bound to be about Europe in one form or another. And that's a much harder case for her to win than if it's just who's the better prime minister, me or Jeremy Corbyn. What do you think? She'd have a really tough time because what it'll come down to is it'll be, uh, it'll be a general election about in or out of the single market and half of her party will peel away. How does she conduct a general election mm -hmm. where the likes of Anna Soubry and a whole lot of others will not stand on the same platform? So I think it's difficult. Okay. But on the other hand, she may reach such a stalemate that she just actually that she just feels calls one. she just needs to because okay. I'm sure she'd get... Let me hear from Todd. No general election next year because she'll split the Tory party and she hasn't got boundary changes through yet. Remember that? That's 2018. Mm -hmm. But there will be one in 2019 when she can't get Brexit through the soft Brexit House of Commons. I wanted to rush you a bit because you really can't have too much of a good thing. And I just want to show a little clip of the former Shadow Chancellor, Ed Bowles, <laughs> from Strictly last night. Let's just watch this. Hands on. There he is. Gosh. It's that hand. That's the worrying bit. I think, uh, I think no longer will we be saying that Ed Bowles is a safe pair of hands. <laughs> Can we agree on that? <laughs> It's really yeah. remarkable. To think he was the man once most feared by David Cameron. It's quite something. <laughs> He'll be a Labour leader. Labour leader 2021. He certainly had, you know, he's hit popular culture in a way that very few politicians do. Charm, gusto, bravery, uh, not being embarrassed, all the things people don't like about politicians. Uh, you, once you're no longer a politician, People love you for not being it anymore. If we had time, I'd run it again. <laughs> 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 we ran out of time. You get it on social media.